Hey, Tex. John, you're looking great. Ah, thank you, thank you. I got to shave. Oh, well, I, I was talking about your, your ball oh, cap. Oh, you like the new power athlete hat that I just got in the mail? So what's cool is uh, I get all like the test stuff. Because my problem is, is every time when Luke would get the test stuff, I would end up with hats that look like yarmulkes. <laughs> and uh, I never wore it. And, and Harry's like, how come you don't wear any power athlete gear? I'm like, because um, everything, nothing ever fits me. No hats, nothing. Um, they're all designed to fit uh, Luke. And so now that I've taken over on this stuff, I'm like, hey, we'll make smaller sizes, but I at least want some stuff that I can wear on the podcast. So I got to, I, I filmed a video the other day wearing our new training flannels, sand sleeves. And, uh, what? You yeah. cut the sleeves off? Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fucking awesome. Uh, I haven't seen that video. Well, if, uh, if people want to buy those flannels, they can actually mail them to me and I'll cut them off for a fee. Why, Why don't they just cut their own sleeves off? Uh, I don't know. Maybe people want John Wellborn approved cut off sleeve flannels. I mean, Did I got you? scissors and just. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I mean, are you going to like sign it? Move uh, the dirt. We, we have a whole line of flags. Harry has had this like concept for all of these dope flags. And we have a move the dirt one that'll be like the final one we release. Uh, the reason it's going to be the final is Spoiler I actually have art. to go up and actually they're going to be uh, hand signed with uh, with numbers. So we're going to do a limited edition on those. So I'm pretty stoked on that. It's pretty awesome. Any other? I mean, we I got a couple hoodies on the way for us. Anything yeah, so else? So we got hoodies. Uh, we just launched the new move the dirt shirts. We got some dope keychains. And uh, it was really just came down to putting some effort in into sourcing some really cool stuff. So. Sweet. I'm also excited to see how Charles displays these on our YouTube channel as you talk about them because mm, they're hot. It. Well, you know, that's what, uh, that's what we call talent. I have and, none of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, when it comes to sitting behind a keyboard fighting wars and making videos, you know, you got to have a talented artist. Yes. Awesome. And when it comes to fighting nutrition wars ah, and empowering the performance. Another awkward transition. Awkward. I thought that was great. <laughs> no, no. So yeah, we're going to wrap a little <laughs> bit about nutrition today. Yes. Uh, we have some uh, questions coming in on the hotline. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we always have a ton of questions coming through. So we have to sift through all the uh, requests and information to find some real gems. And we brought on our illustrious uh, nutrition crew to come on and help us answer some nutrition questions today. That's right. How are we doing, team? Great. That's doing Rob well. and Sam. Sam, so good to hear from you. As you guys oh, yeah. might not know, Sam just had a baby about, what, two weeks ago? Uh, three, yeah, three weeks ago. Three, three weeks. So how old's that baby? 21 days? Three weeks and two days. So yeah. 23 days. 23 days, man. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you guys that are uh, our parents, to think back to 23 days, oh my gosh. Three days, babies are absolutely tiny. I know we were talking about like it's amazing to see how small they are because yeah. now my kids are older and I can't ever imagine. And so when Sam was sharing some pictures, uh, I was like, man, I can't even remember them being that little. So it's uh, it's it's killer. I'm, I'm always happy when another baby enters the world. So especially another power athlete baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have their onesies. Isla is dressed in her onesie, even though she's not on camera. She is in her power athlete onesie right now. <laughs> As she should. Yeah. <laughs> As she should. Awesome. Well, Tex, let's jump on into it and like let's fire up uh, one of our questions off the hotline and see if we can save some lives and help some people and melt some faces. All right. We're talking morning training nutrition. Ready, ready? Go. Hey, what's up, crew? This is Sean, first-time Texan, long-time power athlete fan. Hey, got a question for you all regarding nutrition and stuff like that. So uh, my girlfriend and I, we work out – we try to work out in the mornings. Uh, the problem with that for us is that we tend to get our best workouts like later in the day with uh, after we've had a chance to get some good food in us. What, I know you all tend to work out in the morning. What is uh, what is y'all's morning nutrition routine? Because I feel like if we just get up and and just go straight to the gym, we don't get the best workout. But then if we eat something, we got to kind of hang out um, and let that digest a little bit. What do you all do for that morning nutrition uh, or stuff like that? Do you tend to work out fasted, find you get a good workout like that, and you just got to suck it up? Or I don't know, what, do, what do you all feel about that? Talk to it. Bye. All right, uh, guys, to recap, because um, I don't know if Sam and Rob can hear, uh, the guy called in, said he and his girlfriend trained first, first thing in the morning. Uh, they noticed that they, when they train later in the day, they feel a little bit better, and he thinks it's because they've had some food in them. So his question was, what do we do, or what do we recommend for people that train first thing in the morning? Do we train fasted, or do we eat something, and how does all that work? Perfect. Yeah. Um, this has been a 
pretty common question that we've actually seen uh, in emails too. Um, and I think that uh, for a lot of people, um, you know, like he said that they train better a little bit later in the day. And that is accurate. The more food you have in you, the better you're going to train. You're going to be more fueled. You're going to have a lot more um, energy and, uh, and more ready to train. And I think that, you know, in, in the morning, whatever you can get in that's pretty fast is going to be something that can help you out. And it's going to probably have to be a little trial and error for them to find out what works for them. But I think something like even like a, a whey protein with uh, even bananas or something like that, something fast absorbing is going to give them a little bit of energy and not be heavy in your gut and having a ton of digestion going on while you're trying to work out. So you want something that's going to be pretty fast absorbing. Sam? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, you don't have to make bacon and eggs for breakfast, you know, before you train. Um, and one thing we talk a lot about with our clients and through email is you also don't want to compromise sleep. So if you just feel, hey, like I feel fine during my workout, working out fasted, you know, but I read somewhere that I should eat, try it, like Rob said, trial and error to see kind of work, what works with your gut, but also don't compromise sleep, you know, to eat something super heavy and then let it digest for an hour before you train. We would rather you sleep that hour. <laughs> uh, for me, um, I always trained for a long, long time. I trained fasted, and especially if I was going to do any sprinting or like high intensity type work, I would always, you know, because we have always trained. Well, we always trained at six in the morning. And then when Luke had his daughter, we moved it to seven in the morning just so that because uh, he would have to get up at, get up. you know, 4 a.m., clean the garage. Uh, you know, wash all the cars, uh, fold all of his wife's underwear, and he had to make sure to iron it and put, you know, uh, creases in there. So he couldn't get there before seven. So we pushed the training back to seven, and we've just never gone back to six because I'll tell you, seven's way better than six. Oh, well, I agree. The coaching during the evenings, I'm back at like nine. So then I get to eat dinner, then I get to crash. So that extra hour goes a long way for it, but I still have a morning routine. Just chug a bunch of drip coffee, pour over that I like, and then essentially thorn whey protein in either oatmeal or just smashing some fruit as Rob suggested. So a little carb, a little protein, but a lot of coffee. Yeah, I've gone back and forth on this for years. And um, the guy, and it's funny, I asked Dr. Tom about this every time we talk. I'm like, hey, what does the research say about training in the morning versus training at night? Because um, we're in the middle of the Jack Street shadow cycles mm -hmm. and so um i've been a little late posting it because i've still been testing the workouts mm -hmm. so on friday night i had to go and test one of the workouts and i trained at five because i just got slammed on the whole day and uh i was not nearly as strong at five o'clock as i was usually in the morning and i'd always thought that you were stronger later in the day but i think it's because i've trained so consistently in the morning and usually by the end of the day i'm pretty fucking tired from just looking at a computer and you know fighting all of our battles over you know uh, Slack and email and all the other stuff. So I find for me when I wake up in the morning, like I'm more mentally and maybe physically ready to go train if I eat something. But I also know if I eat too much, fucking saps me. So like it has to be just enough. And I think, you know, but you find that through trial and error. I need about 45 minutes. And then once I go, um, I don't drink coffee until I'm after, uh, until after I train now because I was, uh, I started getting like uh, heart palpitations where all of a sudden my heart started racing too much. That's not a good thing. No, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. no. I, I, dude, I, I am like, hate the idea of pre workout. Th that's like, what I like, did want to tailor yeah. into this conversation about the the pre workout. I, I'm not too concerned about what the research says. I don't promote it at all because of a lot of the mental aspect that you spoke about it, John. Well, the um, I mean, dude, this this goes back ten plus years. But uh, Abijayev, who was the Bulgarian Olympic lifting coach, he came to America. And he did a presentation on how he would train football players. And it was pretty cool. I, I got a copy of his talk, which was obviously translated because he didn't speak English. But he actually wrote out a program. And he was really talked about the idea of training in a lower heart rate. So there was like a, uh, like a lower intensity that you would train with. Because when you went to competition, you could pick up 8 to 10%. 
mm-hmm. in intensity just from just like the, the competition, from, yeah. yeah, from being in the moment. And he was very, very cautious about tapping into that in training. And at that point, I was like, okay, so we're done, you know, howling at the moon, fucking beating your head on the barbell and trying to like, you know, get to a, you know, wound up place. Because unfortunately, after you go there or you start taking pre-workout and you get there every single day, it just fries your adrenals and then you just can't train at a high level. Yeah. So it's both physical and mental. Because then, the, I mean, I've witnessed old teammates, NO Explode came out oh God. when I was in college. So dudes would juice that up an hour before the game peak and then just suck ass once the actual yeah. play started so that's when i got away from it and then you re re like you affirm that with your experience and that like dudes were getting up and then they needed this like it was a freaking drug sure to get ready to train alone i couldn't imagine how it translated when they had a game day sure yeah no I, I'd, I'd be very cautious about taking any pre-workouts like you know if you want to drink some coffee obviously that's fine um, but I think, uh, you know, it really depends on who you are. I mean, if you're a bacon and eggs and you want to eat, you know, a thousand calories before you go train, I wouldn't do it like as you're walking out the door, but finding something that's easily digestible. But, um, I, I'm not, I'm not kidding you for years, Tom and I've always talked about, he's like, you know, you almost mentally feel more ready in the morning, but the body's more willing at night. And he's, mm-hmm. he always talked about that kind of mixed dichotomy. But I, I think it's just from the fact that I've trained in the morning, Um, you know, almost my entire life, it's always been a morning ritual thing. So I think you just mentally just get into that mindset. Yeah. I think, uh, one of the other things, and Sam and I were, were chatting about this, uh, before we got on here was, uh, you know, how are you preparing in your warmups? Um, Mm -hmm. you know, you coming off of just being asleep, are you jumping into, if you're on a power athlete program, you're going to have a warm up that's set up and there's some prep work. Are you doing some sort of pre pre warm up warm up just to kind of get yourself prepared, you know, get that central nervous system kind of fired up? Um, so we were talking about that just before that that maybe that's something you should add in too is get get yourself some sort of pre warm up warm up. Would you you want to expand well, on that, Sam? Um, to, to, just to give you a little caveat, I changed all of the programs to have prep. So I used to call them warm ups, and I stopped using yeah. the word warm up because uh, whatever you because we used to say this at the seminar, uh, we need you to do a pre warm up warm up, and uh, now it's like you need to warm up. The prep isn't your warm up; that's your prep for the deal. You need to do something to warm up. And for me, I ride the assault bike uh, ten minutes. I do you know some uh, you know a few different type movements, and you kind of get ready. You do some isometrics, and like you put a little bit of warm up together, and then you hit your prep. So that's why I transitioned to the term prep instead of warm up. Gotcha. Yeah. Sam. Yep. And no, that's one thing I learned from Tex because it was like get your chili hot, right? You want to warm up before <laughs> get your central nervous system firing before you're hitting anything. Um, I also was a morning warrior, but I would coach the 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. classes. So you know those people are rolling out of bed at 4 15 to get to the gym and just it is a different energy than at night right but you need to still create the momentum to be able to lift heavy weights so fueling and and warming up yeah it's much like the we're not talking about eating breakfast before you change we're changing the label of eating a pre-workout meal or i mean not a meal is even a terrible word for it but something in your belly much like we would redefine the warm up, and it, and uh, back when I was in coaching college, it was we called it a mess up because these kids already had their interpretation of a warm up. So mess up, mobility, elasticity, and stability, uh, just to get them rolling and shock them from what they were used to, whatever the hell high school or personal training program they were coming in from. We can almost take that same approach to the pre-nutrition. It's not like you're eating that whole bacon and eggs. It's just a little bit. We just need a funny phrase, like get your chili hot, but for food. God, God, I, 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 I was like, your, your fucking chili hot thing. I'm like, oh, God damn it. Well, I did. Uh, it sticks. It, 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 it does stick. I borrowed and that. And you're like saying it and you're like. <laughs> get your chili hot i no, i borrowed it it was coach tim cross at university of texas he was the uh he was an offensive lineman nfl coach tim cross and he was the chili hot coach he was a get your chili hot coach he was that coordinator 
that really got the locker room going or if some oh, kid he was, was feeling he, down. He was a brother coordinator? And was he a white back, dude or a black dude? No, he was a black dude. Uh-huh. And then like if they needed a m- mental toughness guy, mm-hmm. they UT at that time, they changed the weight room every coach. But at the time I was there, they had this back room that was all storage. But then they put some like wrestling mats down, some some boxing gloves, all that gear back there. And Coach Cross would, if dudes needed extra work or some mental toughness training, they'd go and uh, spar a little bit. And oh. then, man, he we got along great. Get your chili hot was always his thing. If he saw somebody down, and he knew how to read a room. Yeah. So I, I learned that from him, and, and that was one of his calls. But we just need that for now in nutrition. Well, um, I think a lot of nutrition, and you guys you know, deal with this on a daily basis, is really just finding out what works for you. And I always think it's funny when people are like, oh, what works for you? I'm like... I'm going to tell you what I do. You might you might try to mimic it, but at the end of the day, you have to figure out what works for you. I remember there were years where I'd like the thought of like training with something in my stomach was like, oh man, I'm going to throw up. Mm-hmm. And then I got to the point where I was like, I'm gassing out in these workouts where I didn't gas before and kind of had to make a slow transition. So uh, that idea of like, you might be this way today, but maybe not in 10 years, you won't be there, you know, because obviously we're mm-hmm. not just doing this for one or two years. We're doing this for decades. This is just the way we do it. Well, what would be a check-in? Like... Are you measuring your sleep? Because in Trainer Heroic, we have that little wellness survey, readiness survey. Like, what are they taking it seriously? Or are they just rolling in there to think, oh, it's got to be my food and neglecting the rest of their lives and how it affects their ability to train in the morning? Probably food. Um, and that's what we work a lot with our clients is that recovery aspect. So it's like, hey, how are you sleeping? How are you feeling? Um, how are workouts going? I mean, when my weekly check-ins with my clients, they're a lot more than just, did you hit your macros? Did you stay on track calorically? Right. It's a huge, it's a whole picture when it comes to like wellness and performance versus just what am I eating and what am I lifting? So what is that check-in experience that y'all provide? Give us an example. Like what is, what is that full walkthrough? Do you got a system? Yes. And again, it can be tailored to each individual client. Um, but we talk about their weekly goals. So could be hydration, could be sleep, could be hitting 10,000 steps, could be training three days a week. Um, you know, for like the busy, busy parent, you know, sometimes goals have to start smaller and then you get to the, the bigger goal. Um, talk about recovery, sleep, work, stress, um, Again, it depends on the client, but I have a list of things, and I think Rob does as well, that you kind of bring to the bring to your forefront. Um, because not everybody thinks like, oh, I'm sitting at a computer. Yeah, my stress is very high, right? John hit it on the head. Training after sitting on your computer all day, it's hard because <laughs> you're mentally drained. <laughs> uh people um like uh I, I I was watching a whole bunch of stuff on like uh energy balance. And, um, you know, the idea of like, hey, like, let's say you go lift weights for 45 to an hour, like call that, you know, let's say you're in the weight room for 70 minutes. Like how many, like how much time are you really under the barbell? So call it 45, 50 minutes of like legit training after you warm up and you get done with everything. So then uh, how do you look at calorie balance? And I know, Sam, we talked about this recently in terms of like managing calorie balance with clients. So then like what other work? Do you have a job where you're sitting behind a computer? You said, Terry, do you have a job where you're working construction and breaking rocks and, you know, fucking just out there moving all the time? And uh, for most people, I would say maybe it's uh, a ton of sitting. So then it's like, okay, I put in my 45, 50 minutes. Um, How much exercise or work do I need to do outside of that to can stay in my energy, you know, let's say energy deficit or a caloric deficit. So then it would you know, 45, 50 minutes of aerobic work be as beneficial as maybe getting out and taking, you know, three, 10, 15 minute walks a day. And so the, um, I was reading a bunch of stuff on, on that and more consistent exercise over the course of a day. So like going out for like a couple walks or maybe jumping on the assault bike for 15 minutes and being able to kind of do it was more beneficial than just like lifting weights and then an hour of some aerobic work. But uh, you know, lifting weights and getting some aerobic work in obviously is more beneficial than doing nothing. So, you know, how do you, how, you know, how do you skin it? And the idea of like, you know, constantly moving and getting up and being able to, you know, stay in that, uh, you know, calorie balance. I know personally I have my Garmin watch and it does that move every 15 minutes. 
So it like sets a timer like, oh yeah, I have been, you know, doing emails for 15 or whatever time you set it for minutes. I'm going to do like a lap around the room or two laps around the room. Then I'm going to come back. Um, so setting little goals like that can help with that energy balance and just moving throughout the day. It'll help your hips too. Have you ever just like sat all day and you're like, I'm so sore. Oh, we do a podcast, Sam. <laughs> oh yeah. It's horrible. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the crazy man at the gall at the, gas pump that if you're on a long road trip that I'm over there doing all kinds of like little mobility <laughs> and stuff like that. I, you know, it looks kind of weird doing hip circles and kind of hip thrusts as you're pumping gas, but <laughs> I'm, I'm that guy. Cause I can't stand being, I can't stand looking like uh, evolutionary man as you're getting out of the car and you kind of go from that really stumped over to really tall just because your hips are so tight. But I'm, yeah, I'm that guy. Um, there was something that, that y'all said that, um, I think um, your point, John, that, you know, at the end of the day, the the activity over the course of the day, you, you know, one of the things that, that we can easily do to affect our total daily energy expenditure is to move. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can move, because most of us are just chained to a desk as desk jockeys, at least most of the people that we see. And most of the people that I talk to, not not that many people are that active. So, you know, just like you said, just getting up, moving every hour or so, or even those 10 minute walks are just are super beneficial to that total daily energy expenditure. So that how can, help with, oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, that Sam. can help with like um, hunger too, right? We eat a lot of times when we're bored. Um, so something I'll tell my clients if, they're not super calorically restricted, but they're, you know, trying to lose weight. It's, Hey, stand up, walk for 10 minutes, drink, you know, 20 ounces of water. And then are you still hungry? And a lot of times, no, you just needed to move. You needed something like for that, like oral fixation for lack of a better yep, um, <laughs> term. And then you're good. So that's a trick I've used for clients. How can we get a, a guide now? for our, our listeners here to say, Hey, we want you to consume 500 calories first and then try 250. Or is it a matter of just, Hey, do nothing. See how you measure your workout and then move on from there. How can we give them actionable steps to make sure that this is not just a guessing game for his morning nutrition? Uh, I would start more conservative than 500 calories. Uh, you know, you typically, uh, you know, there's a, this, of course, this is kind of post-workout, but there is, you know, a little debate about an anabolic window. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is pretty important for someone that is an early morning trainer training that they do need to get some food in at some point. And I think that it it really just needs to be about 10 grams of, of uh, essential amino acids. So you want something that's going to, you know, that's got a good amino profile whey protein's got a decent amino profile eggs have the best amino uh, acid profile and then you would want to throw in something you know carby so you know you you really probably need less than 10 or 200 calories or so just to get you started uh, and then you can kind of start there and you can adjust up or down as you need to and it like we've said before it's going to be very individual uh, mm -hmm. like myself even now, still at 53 years old, I, if I was to train early in the morning, I would probably train fasted just because I can't stand to have something really heavy in my stomach when I train. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who, who did we have? Was it Keith Bar? We had on podcast where we discussed um, pro, um, collagen. No, he, uh, don't you remember he talked about all the studies <clears throat> that, for the window yeah. that had to do with the anabolic window were done on old people. And, uh, you know, for older people, as you age, the anabolic window shrinks. And so that idea of like 45 minutes to an hour was for people that were, you know, sarcopenia, trying not to lose muscle or old people. Obviously, the younger you go, the larger the anabolic window. And some of the research that he ended up forwarding, forwarding me showed some, um, some kids in their 20s having an anabolic window of 48 to 72 hours. So the idea that, you know, as soon as you leave the gym, you know, you're out there popping your, you know, fucking weight gainer 9,000, you know, trying to hit your anabolic window. So uh, that's a, a, a massive piece of bro science. But, uh, you know, 
for the younger individual, for the bro. Now for the older people, it becomes much more important. Hey, you know what? As soon as I get done training, I got this 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but I think it, uh, it really becomes, you know, more of a, um, you know, an issue if you're trying to put on muscle, but if you're just in there training, it just becomes less of an issue. Yeah. On that note in my protein, I mentioned earlier with my morning routine is, a, is collagen powder based off that Keith Barr and man, he was, that was an awesome episode. That was good. I'll find the number. I think yeah. three, five, one. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, that that was a really good episode, and he did talk about that. And I think I think one of the other things he mentioned was uh, people over forty, uh, like like you said, you know, we just uh, people like myself are just as we get a little bit older, maybe not myself compared to peers, because I you know I've been doing this for a long time, but we are um, we do tend to start to see some decay in our in our stomach lining. Uh, so our ability to process things is a little less. So we do need to take advantage of some of those things. And then I think the early morning, because uh, the early morning person probably could benefit a little bit from getting something in either before or after. Uh, and it really, I think some of the literature that I've read, it's either way before or after is, is uh, actually pretty beneficial. Um, and it just, again, comes down to the individual. What about supplements? Are there any supplements that uh, you guys like to take or that you recommend people do? I mean, I'm not a huge supplement guy unless we've done some form of micronutrient testing. Um, you know, the idea of like, hey, bro, I started taking this copper and now I feel great. Well, I take copper and I don't feel great because I couldn't be copper deficient. So, I mean, that's how we get most of our really good supplement recommendations is from friends and people we train with being like, I took this and I felt great. But with no measurable or marketable, uh, you know, idea of what they're taking more so than just like, okay, you know, somebody told me to take this. And by we, you mean you were speaking like a bro, yeah, not us. Yeah, yeah, not us. You and I get blood uh, work. We get blood work done. And based off of that, I go through and there's a whole micronutrient panel that I get done. And then I figure out where I'm micronutrient deficient. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's pretty fascinating to like, look at the micronutrient deficiencies and see how they end up playing into like your greater health. Like I was just reading a ton of stuff on uh, chromium deficiency and chromium mm. deficiency uh, prevents uh, glucose from entering the cell and can present as like a diabetic issue. So, I mean, there's like some really, really fascinating stuff with that. So um, instead of just being like, okay, well, I'm going to take this. And my, my, my question, I remember I asked Tom this years ago is, why do I got to take all these supplements if I'm eating a pretty clean diet? And his comment was the food that we're eating today is not as micronutrient dense as it was a hundred years ago. He goes a hundred years ago, he goes, we probably had 10 times the nutrients when you ate kale or cruciferous vegetables or this, it was packed full of nutrients, but because we've effectively, you know, grow seasons just kind of stripping out and, um, you know, uh, the grass is in as nutrient dense, which we got from, uh, um, God, uh, the forage agronomist. Yeah. Um, this is, I'm sorry. This is no, his name is Ballister. Yep. Tim, um, Peter, Peter Ballerstead. Ballerstead. So years ago we had a guy on the podcast named Peter Ballerstead, who was the world's foremost forage agronomist, which means he traveled the world looking for the most nutrient dense grass. And the way that he found the most nutrient dense grass is they would go places, they would slaughter the animals and then they would look at the nutrient, uh, um, density in these animals. They would take the grass take it back to Oregon, grow it, and then they would test it on their own animals. So he traveled the world looking for this for the most nutrient-dense grass for grazing animals. And that's Power Athlete Radio's <laughs> episode 152. Yep. And Keith Barr is 352. So uh, those two podcasts were extremely impactful um, because his comment was the, you know, the fact that he's searching the world for the most nutrient-dense grass because the grass is so low in nutrients. But it's the same thing if we look at the foods that we're eating today, they are not, they're one-tenth of what they were a hundred years ago. And um, Tom made a good point. He goes, if we had lived a hundred years ago eating our diet, we would have been dramatically healthier and in better shape, more jacked everything than we are today. So as a result, that's where that micronutrient testing comes in to figure out where you're deficient. I mean, it's, it's pretty fascinating to sit down and look at all the pathways and be like, hey, if you're deficient in this, this is kind of the result. And it's everything from like blood sugar control, um, you know, thyroid function. I mean, all these different autonomic systems that we need to kind of work with. One comment on that episode, and this is props to Callie, her title selection, starting a beef, starting a major beef, 
with Peter Ballerstedt. Yeah, well, the reason we had Peter on, um, I had always been a huge proponent of, uh, uh, you know, grain or sorry, uh, grass fed meat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, you know, if you can get, um, you know, uh, eat animals that had been raised the majority of their life, you know, 80, 90% of, uh, 90% on grass, you're farther ahead. And I heard Peter, I spoke at the Ancestral Health Symposium, so did Peter, and I got a chance to listen to his talk. And he's like, most rudiments, almost all rudiments are raised on grass for the majority of their life. There's no other way to raise them. So the idea of, you know, that these animals are raised in feedlots doesn't really exist. He's like, it's just not feasible to do it. So we, you know, most of them grazing. Now when they bring the animals in for slaughter, they'll send them to the feedlot, pump them up full of corn because what it'll effectively do is make the meat more fatty so that when they slaughter them and then they grade the meat, and that's the way they, the USDA grades meat is based upon fat content. So the fattier the meat, the higher the grade. That's why if you get a cow that's been raised purely on grass, never said to a lot, never fed any feed, it's super lean and it grades down as choice. Mm -hmm. So years ago, I bought a, gra a cow that had been raised its whole life on grass. I thought it was delicious, uh, but the problem was the meat uh, was just not very marbled like what you'd expect. So when you sit down and you look at like a really nice ribeye that's heavily marbled, that is, uh, you know, let's say, I guess prime or whatever the top, top cut is, that animal's been fattened up, you know, specifically for that uh, grading. So um, I always had this, you know, misconception that there was these, you know, feedlot animals. And if you, you know, subscribe to any PETA vegan fucking nonsense and those fucking Martians, they would have you believe that, but we know that's not the case. And so we brought Peter on to kind of dispel it. And he's like, the first thing is, are you eating meat? If yes, then now you can look at it and say, okay, locally processed grass fed, obviously being the best. But at the end of the day, um, you know, all the kind of the, the touch points that people were using being like, oh, it's got a different omega-3 profile. Well, if that's the case, then don't ever eat a walnut because that'll destroy your omega-3, omega-6 protocol. So a lot of these um, arguments that even I was making and using in our nutrition talk on Cross of Football uh, were just bullshit arguments that uh, Maya just kind of, you know, continued to kind of populate based off of the information I had. So coming on there, Man, that was uh, a revolutionary podcast for us in terms of changing our narrative and being like, okay, are you eating meat? Great. Now, once you answer yes, let's figure out the next step down on this and saying, okay, where are you sourcing it? You know, are you, you know, doing locally owned? Is it grass fed? Like, you know, are you supporting local farmers? What is the carbon load and, uh, you know, pollution look like to transport this around the country, or around the world? Um, so I thought that was an excellent, uh, excellent podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. The nutrient deficiency. So if you guys are interested more in this, um, you guys can reach out to Sam and Rob and, you know, book a mm -hmm. consult and we can go through this stuff and I'm sure they can recommend a few places. You guys can go and get some testing, get some micronutrient stuff done and, and potentially dial this in. Yeah. I, I had a virtual training client and he got some blood work done and it was like a, an alley-oop to Rob to bring it home, to set this dude straight. I can help with the movement and Rob's got his nutrition getting dialed in. Nice. Uh, how's that going, Rob? Without giving away any deets. Good. I need to. Uh, I need to hear how his. He was getting some new blood work going, and so I wanted to kind of follow up with him and see how that went. Well, so, the, I'm sure the shadow yeah. cycle is just up in his testosterone because that's well, just what happens. Uh, uh, the yeah, right. um, you know, whenever I mean, and and I get emails. I'm sure you guys like, hey, what kind? You know, and they're going to hear this podcast and be like, well, what kind of blood work should I go and get done? And if you go and you ask your doctor for blood work, all he's going to do is just basic run a, a basic panel for you. Um, none of the real jiggy stuff. So we have a uh, um, stuff on power athlete, uh, hq.com within the blog about blood work. And, uh, we've done talk to, you know, we've had Dr. Tom on and we've talked about this, but I think like a basic hormone panel is important. I think that if you're going to get some cholesterol done, you should look at LDL particle size as an important distincting factor. I just had a question from a guy whose cholesterol was high and the doctor wanted to put him on meds. And my first question was, what was your LDL particle size? He didn't test that. What? Well, if the particle size is really big, then it's big and fluffy. And Chris Masterjohn and also Chris Kresser have a ton of information on this. But the larger the particle, it floats along. So all of a sudden, um, high blood or um, high cholesterol is, is much less of an issue. 
Now, if the particle size is really, really small and they're extremely dense particles, then they attach within the lining of the artery. And now it becomes a big problem. And there's a whole, you know, dissertation on lipoproteins and transporting it across the bloodstream that uh, Chris Masterjohn did at the Ancestral Health Symposium, same talk. So, and uh, Chris Kresser, if you do a Google search on it, has a ton of stuff. But it seems like a basic question. Like before you put this guy on, you know, uh, cholesterol meds, you know, let's look at particle size. And then also what's dictating particle size is blood sugar. So if your blood sugar is chronically high, like you're consistently in the 150s, 200s, 300s, now all of a sudden your particles are going to be smaller. If your blood sugar is 80 or 83, let's say, uh, most people are between that 70 and 100, uh, you're pretty far or you're going to have potentially bigger particles and big fluffy ones that just get to float on by. I think uh, dietary fiber also is part and parcel to all that too. So that's, uh, I think, uh, you know, like you said, just having all that stuff squared away and getting more than just the conventional doctor's uh, blood panel, which is super basic and really doesn't tell you, I don't think a whole lot. What so. what would be some good sources of uh, dietary fiber that people could get if they wanted to eat like a, like a, you know, like we recommend like a isocaloric more what we would, well, we are much lower carb than the, you know, the, uh, food pyramid. I mean, we're a high protein kind of moderate fat, moderate carb kind of diet, uh, approach, but how would people get types of fiber in there? Cause fiber is extremely important for the gut biome and, you know, being able to move all that stuff through the blood. Yeah. I mean, if people are getting their Roy B. Jiv and they're going to get a really, a big dose of fiber in through all that. I think also sticking to some things like, um, you know, very cellulose types of things like a uh, potato, some potatoes, sweet potatoes and things like that are going to really help with a lot of that, that fiber. But, you know, that's one of the things that I, I know Sam and I both hit on with our clients is Roy B. Jiv all day long, yep. right? Just get all that stuff. And then you're less, you're less likely to be, um, having some of those nutrient deficiencies and, and you're keeping a good uh, flow of fiber coming through your system. So where do you get the blue or the indigo and the violet on the Roy G. Biv? Because uh, for me personally... Big eggplant guy, right? Uh, no. First of all, I hate eggplant. Uh, I'll tell you, if I test my blood sugar, uh, Japanese sweet potatoes, the purple ones, oh, spike yeah. me dramatically higher than a normal sweet potato. White potatoes obviously being the max. Uh, the Japanese purple ones, which I love, go up pretty so good. good. Oh. The cinnamon, just they're the best. Roast them. Oh my God. Uh, what's what's also interesting is so you, um, I pulled out all this stuff about man, it was about 12, 13, no, 14 years ago. Yeah, it would have been about 14 years ago, which is fucking seems like yesterday. Um, I got, uh, I went, you know, and this is why I was still playing the NFL. I went to Dr. Tom. <laughs> And I got my annual blood or biannual blood work done at the end of the season. I remember getting everything and my fasting blood glucose was like 101. And um, at that time we started talking, you know, he's like, you don't have any of the markers for any of this stuff. I mean, uh, but your fasting blood glucose is high. So I got a glucose meter and I tested my blood before and after every meal. So eight times a day for about eight months. And it was pretty fascinating. I would always wake up high. And then as soon as I ate, my blood sugar would fall and it would stay low for most of the day. And uh, depended on the food, like uh, white potatoes and white rice spiked me huge. Um, red wine did absolutely nothing to my blood sugar. So it was pretty interesting. I had this whole journal of all these different foods that I knew if I could keep my blood sugar consistently around 80, 83, 85, somewhere around there, I never put on an ounce of fat when I was, uh, uh, when I was training. So it was pretty fascinating. And then I found like uh, fresh cinnamon. I would grind fresh cinnamon and things and I could keep my blood sugar. If it ever spiked up, I'd just go on the bike and use non-media glucose uptake, like a little bit of aerobic exercise to drop it. So it was pretty interesting <clears throat> when, um, you know, the idea of like blood sugar control, you know, but if you go into like the Lane Norton camp, it's like, oh, that's all bullshit. And I'm like, it, well, it is until it isn't. We know that people that have chronically high blood sugar have higher inflammation and tend to be more obese than people that aren't. So, you know, I mean, and, and, and all you got to do is look at type one diabetics, which I just got done reading Dr. Bernstein's book on type one diabetes. Um, it's pretty fascinating. If you look at the people, uh, you know, the type one diabetics that follow his low carb, high protein approach, uh, all those kids are pretty lean and in pretty good shape. When you look at the kids that follow the ADA recommendations of a higher carb diet, 
uh, their eyes are sunk and they have like a 20 to 30 percent higher rate of obesity than we have in this country presently. And most of those kids end up developing type 2 diabetes on the backside of this thing. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, we're basically removing the control for, you know, like, uh, you know, the body's control for insulin. And now it becomes more of a more of an issue. So it's pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah, this is kind of jumping back to the vegetables. Um, just a warning. If you went from go from not eating vegetables to eating a shit ton of vegetables, you're probably going to be pretty gassy. So ease into it, um, especially if it's, you know, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, even some greens, like your gut just might not be so happy because uh, the increase in fiber. So you can gradually get there or take a green supplement for a couple of weeks in addition to adding in vegetables. And then you can have them at every meal and be fine. But the just... other thing too, is you got to cook them down. So make sure yeah, you're cooking cook your vegetables, uh, you know, whether you throw them in the oven or you want to boil them a little bit, you need them to be soft because that makes it more digestible. I found that, mm -hmm. uh, the people that all of a sudden started eating vegetables, all of a sudden like, Oh, I had a big salad with all these raw vegetables. And you're like, Oh God. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that GI distress and that gas you're having is because the body is not able to break them down. You have to have right. the vegetables cooked to be able to break them down. Like raw kale, bad news. Cooked kale, yeah, no. way better. <laughs> it's a big salad. You see their progress pics and you're like, oh no, what did I do to them? Oh, you're eating vegetables. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden they have all that like lower GI God. bloat and you're like... <laughs> Uh, they're like, I have this strange little pooch and I'm farting like a sick animal. And you're like, oh. <laughs> like, 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 are you pregnant? You're yeah. a man. <laughs> it's like uh, on Easter, my dogs got into some of their, uh, like, like the kids' um, uh, uh, chocolate. And my one dog was over there just like laying on his pillow farting. And I'm like, oh God. I'm like, I hope this serves <laughs> you right, you scary you little bastard. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they'd make adjustments and avoid that or did they go right back to it? Uh, they are, they'll eat their own poop. Okay. Yeah. So dogs are good point. I love dogs, but like, uh, I have like, like they have, like if they throw up, they'll eat that throw up immediately <laughs> and then they'll go over and try to lick throw your face. Throw it up again. Oh yeah. No, I mean, dude, they're like, Oh wait, already pre-digested and warm. Let me eat that again. It's, and, uh, John, this is called a second harvest. Uh, dude, <laughs> dog, like, like, cows. like you gotta have a dog. Like, so then this is pretty funny. Um, I think everybody should have a dog when they have kids because um, the kids drop food everywhere and the dogs just eat it. Like I, I remember the kids having food all over and the dogs just over there cleaning them up. And yeah. now that the kids are older, the dogs still follow them around, but they're like pissed off that the kids aren't dropping food anymore because obviously they're you know not babies. So like they'll kind of like go around, they still lick the floor and I'm like, oh, you idiots. They haven't dropped food for years <laughs> and you guys are still on this. <laughs> yeah, it is really convenient though. Oh. I mean... You know, eggs, yogurt, whatever she's eating, chicken, pork. I'm surprised Freya hasn't gained 15 pounds. Oh, and, the and, and the dog couldn't be happier. The dog's like, this is great. This little human is just dropping food everywhere. The problem, though, is once the kids grow up and stop dropping yeah. food, the dog doesn't be like, oh, well, the, uh, the food supplier is gone. They still are like sitting there, like watching you and following you. I'm like, get the fuck away well, they, from me. They look yeah. for the weakest link at the table. So, right. so what happens, and, and I, I learned this about dogs, um, if you do something once, the dog is always expecting you to do it. So like if you feed him from the table once, what do you mean? I don't get fed from the table every time. So like once that happens, and so when I had my dogs before we had kids, I never fed the dogs from the table. So they never even came over to the table. They just stayed mm -hmm. and like they just, it just never Didn't happened. Know. And then the kids came, they dropped all that shit, and now those dogs are underneath the table like like sharks waiting for like seals in like the uh, uh, South Africa. Like anything drops, pew, shoots right on it. I mean, it's great because you never have to clean the floor, but fuck, it's kind of annoying. This dog's always jumping over your foot to try to, you know, lick the kids. Like on Christmas va vacation <laughs> when the yeah. dog's just like. Oh, he got himself, a, he's probably in the trash, got himself a chicken bone. <laughs> That's right. He's like, maybe if you didn't feed him from the table, Eddie. Nah, he got that out of the trash. <laughs> all right God so Good. uh just to reiterate um if you train first thing in the morning uh get up a little earlier find something that's easily digestible that doesn't sit heavy on your on your stomach eat it go test see how you're doing and then just kind of fine tune a little bit until you can figure out what works for you and sean why not get blood work Maybe there's something there that you just find your energy levels are low for a reason. Well, I mean, there's, there's some really fascinating stuff with blood sugar. Um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, high intensity exercise, like that was a really pretty fascinating one um, with, uh, with the CrossFit. And I know 
that this is what kind of drove the wedge between Glassman and Rob Wolf, where Rob started doing all the nutrition coaching and was finding that the CrossFit high intensity exercise was spiking people's blood sugar and causing a lot of issues. And uh, I think it was Dutch Lowy's girlfriend was the, was the kind of the reached out and was like, you know, I'm having all these blood sugar issues and it was from that deal. So there were certain people that don't handle high intensity exercise. Like if you were to take a diabetic and put them into CrossFit, and I know this because I had a type one diabetic client years ago, uh, you know, it, it would basically, he had to dose with insulin before he had to monitor his blood sugar rate after and really dial that thing. And I'm like, why don't we just do some aerobic work and lift some weights, keep your heart rate down and not spike the fuck out of your blood sugar. And so, um, you know, lifting weights and doing some, uh, aerobic and some, you know, anabolic type lifting is really good for that community. Boom. Cool. Thanks, Sean. No problem. Thanks, nutrition team. Thanks, nutrition ninjas. Ninjas. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. So, That's right. so it's funny. We watch, um, God, what is it? Uh, PJ Mask. You guys ever you familiar with PJ oh. Mask? Yes. So there's uh, there's like the bad guys, like they're like the night ninjas. And so I like I'm sitting there as I'm like working, and like the kid, like my son's watching PJ Mask, and uh, unfortunately I end up like absorbing all these cartoons through osmosis. Like on, if you go into Johnny Bod, yeah, uh, all the, all the names are like Ninjago <laughs> characters now. Before it was like all the Power Rangers. So whatever he's into. Uh, when I'm doing the programming, I'm like, what are you watching, Ninjago? All right, let me give me all the, all the bad guys in Ninjago. <laughs> so that's how I pick that stuff. Boom. All right. Thank you, team. We'll talk to you shortly. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. I'm going back. I'm a loaded freight train and I'm right on track. I'm